No? Hello? Hi. Sorry, we're just making sure that the, uh, the YouTube page starts updating. Mm-hmm. Are you on the YouTube page? That looks like. Here, I'll, I'll, I found the YouTube page link, so I'll just, I'll, I'll try to do it then. That should be it. Did you add it to the YouTube okay. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started here. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's here listening and uh, submitting their questions. And also thanks to Rachel Boynton, the uh, producer and director of Big Men. And thank you very much to Jim Musselman, former Cosmos Energy CEO, as well as Ian Gary, the senior policy uh, manager of extractive industries at Oxfam America. Um, we're really excited to have you all with us today. And um, congratulations on the broadcast last night. Um, uh, the film will be streaming on POV's website until September 24th, uh, 2014, so you can watch that whenever you'd like for free, and um, we hope you will. Uh, so to get started, um, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, Rachel, can you briefly uh, describe it for anyone who hasn't seen it? Um, well, it's, it's a film that follows an oil company called Cosmos Energy. It started out as, a, you know, kind of a, a startup started by a handful of guys in Dallas, Texas. And they drilled their first well as a company in 2007, and with it they dis discovered a massive oil field off the coast of Ghana, which became known as the Jubilee Field. And it was really the first commercial field in Ghana's history. And they gave me permission to follow them as they developed the country's first oil field. So Big Men tracks Cosmos basically from 2007 through 2011. Um, and at the same time, I was traveling to Nigeria, which is just about 200 miles down the coast in West Africa, where they've had oil for about 50-some-odd years, and it's been uh, very difficult going. So I spent a lot of time in Nigeria looking around, filming principally with a group of militants in the Niger Delta, who are blowing up pipelines and demanding more money for their region. Um, and it's really this mosaic of a film about everyone kind of going after the same stuff. Sure. And how did you come to make this film? Um, what drew you to the subject? Uh, I started thinking about the film back in 2005 when I finished my last film. I made a film called Our Brand is Crisis, which is about a group of American political consultants, including James Carville, who go to Bolivia and run a presidential campaign there for a guy who wants to be president of Bolivia. Um, and when I finished that film, I finished it in 2005, and, you know, everybody was talking about peak oil at the time, and you really couldn't escape um, a conversation about oil. It was everywhere in the news. But I was feeling like I had never really seen anything about the oil business from inside the business. Um, it seemed to me like everything I was seeing was very politicized and very much an outsider's view. And I was, I'm always interested in worlds that I'm not seeing. And so I thought, what would that look like? You know, is it possible to get, you know, the oil, the world of oil to share their story? Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the idea. And um, Jim, uh, what made you decide to do the film? What made you decide to speak with Rachel? I get asked that question a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. Because it's uh, it, it, as as all of y'all have seen the movie, there was some uncomfortable parts to it. But, uh, but, uh, it seems like we're having a little bit of a connection issue, Jim. Um, one second. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Uh, while we work on that for a second, um, Rachel, can I ask you another question uh, while we reconnect, Jim? Um, can you go over a little bit of the process of making the film? It was a 
long filming process and um, uh, yeah, could you describe that process briefly? Sorry. Um, well, this is uh, what's traditionally called a verite film, which means that you follow things over time as they're happening. Uh, it's very different from making a film where something's already happened and you're telling a story that you essentially already know, or even a film that's about a subject matter that's essentially based on interviews where you're trying to essentially put together um, an essay. It, it's a, it, it was a very complicated film to make because it's taking a lot of things that are happening simultaneously and it's following them over a number of years. Um, and honestly, it's kind of an impossible film to make. I, I watch it now and I think to myself, what in the world was I thinking? <laughs> like, it's, it's, um, it kind of shouldn't exist. I mean, it's a very difficult thing. It's very difficult to meet people like Jim Musselman who are um, you know, essentially confident enough and strong enough in, in their, their self and, and willing to allow somebody like me to essentially invade the state. Um, that's not easy to begin with, and then maintaining that kind of access over years, and and also figuring out a way to be in the right place at the right time, and to interweave the subjects. Um, that was enormously difficult. Uh, it took many years to figure out. Sure. Let's see if we can get Jim's answer now. Um, sorry about that, Jim. Uh, I think I think we just have to be a little delayed. Um, so to ask the question, to ask the question again, um, what made you decide to speak with Rachel and be part of this film? It was very deep, and I thought it was a, uh, I was I was proud of what we were doing. I thought we had a wonderful opportunity uh, to create something uh, interesting and and uh, good in for the country of Ghana, and so I was. I was proud to tell the story. Obviously, the story had some twists and turns, and it it became a a better a better more uh, entertaining movie as time went on. But at the time we started, it seemed to be a pretty straightforward idea. Sure. And um, I'm curious for both of you. How did you seem to How did you develop trust as the uh, filmmaking went on? Well, that's a question for Jim. Jim, <laughs> how did uh, Rachel develop trust? Once again, I, as as you've seen the movie, I think the movie's an honest movie. I think it uh, it it shows the good things and the bad things, and uh, and I and I think that was important to tell the story. What what I like is that people, I think people appreciate the difficult thing that we. Sorry, everyone. It seems like we're having the same issue again. Um, let's see. Let's see if Jim's feed comes back. Jim, uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I think we, we lost you okay. mid sentence there. Sorry, sorry about that. Well, I've just said that, the, again, to repeat, is that uh, what, what we do, the, what the industry does in, in pretty difficult environments a lot of times is, 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 dif is difficult. And I, I think it was important that Rachel show um, the ins and outs and the, uh, the, the good things and the bad things of the, uh, the, whole co uh, the whole process of, number one, finding oil, but then producing it and dealing with uh, uh, governments in places that sometimes aren't, aren't the most... Um, most comfortable. Jim, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, your, your screen seems to... Oh, there you go again. Okay. Uh, sorry, did you want to just finish that thought? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on for a minute, and uh, hopefully this comes back again, and we'll just have to keep picking it up midway. Uh, apologies to everybody. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. So, uh, <clears throat> Rachel. <laughs> 
Um, what are some of the things that you hope to see for the film uh, past PBS's broadcast that's already um, been in festivals and in theaters and stuff, but uh, what's, some, what's your greatest wish for what will happen next? Um, well, you know, I hope people... I mean, I, I, I actually hope that people will watch the full version on Vimeo. I'm, I'm, you know, the version on POV is, is almost 20 minutes shorter than the original, so I really hope people will watch the full version because... I'm, I'm, as a director, kind of attached to the full film. Um, but, uh, you know, and I hope that the film will live on. One thing I can say that I'm extremely um, pleased about in terms of the POV broadcast is you guys put together a phenomenal discussion um, guide and a lesson plan, and I think those things are really amazing, and I hope that people will use those resources to, to take the film and, and use it to discuss a lot of the issues that are brought up in the movie that are so important. Um, I also hope that people like Ian, who we are lucky enough to have with us today, um, that people like Ian can find usefulness for the film um, in terms of bringing up important subject matters and, and illustrating them in their work. You know, I, if, if it can serve as a tool for places like Oxfam, that's a great achievement. So, and just so everybody knows, um, you can find all the discussion guide, the discussion guide, and the lesson plan, and as well as other um, educational materials on POV's website at POV at pbs.org/pov/bigmen. Um, you'll see that discussion guides, lesson plans, more interviews with Rachel. So please visit that site. Um, and Ian, hi there. Hi. <laughs> Um, what do you think about the film? Uh, could you give us a little bit of uh, your thoughts on it, having seen it now? Well, I thought it was a great film, and I've seen it now with, with audiences in, in the U.S., but also with audiences in Ghana, which was most fascinating. And being able to watch the reactions in some, some parts of the film that you watch in the U.S., and, and people are, are just like, that's so depressing. And then you go to Ghana and people are laughing at the same scene, you know, and it's all particular points of view and uh, backgrounds that people bring to the film and, and uh, what they see in the film is really, really fascinating. But I think for, for Oxfam it's been great to collaborate with Rachel because uh, she was able to create a film that's not only engaging and informative but provides a platform for discussion. So when we helped organize the premiere of the film in Ghana. Uh, it really dominated the airwaves for over a week. Um, she was on television. Some of the local watchdog groups that, that we support uh, were on radio and TV putting forward some of their recommendations for what needs to happen uh, in the oil industry to make the best use of the, the billions of dollars that are coming in now to Ghana. So it certainly sparked uh, a lot of debate. And, even for somebody like me who's watched the Ghana oil industry develop since the Jubilee discover, discovery in 2007 and followed it very closely, uh, like Rachel said, it's an industry that's very hard to penetrate. And so I learned a lot just from watching the film myself. And so it's amazing the kind of access she was able to get. Um, but also, I think, a credit to somebody like uh, Jim who was able to open up uh, the process for, for pre people to learn and see in, a, in an unvarnished way. Great. Now yeah, let's try to get Jim in here again. Hi, Jim. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, we, I know we kind of got cut off there, but um, what, did, what did you think about the film after you saw the final cut, hopefully with the 20 minutes uh, <laughs> added in? <laughs> yeah, I, fortunately I've seen it several times and uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 as I said earlier, the film can be uncomfortable sometimes for me because, but, but on on balance, I think it's very fair and and straightforward, and it, it's, uh, you know, it makes me sad oh, no. sometimes because I think we had such a good opportunity to do really. That's the thing that I come away with, just a little sadness that that what could have been in the country of Ghana had we have had a better a better run at it. Sure. Um, looking back now, how do you feel about the decision to drill in the Jubilee Field? Oh, it's one one of one of the best decisions of my life, clearly. So it was a it was a good thing. So uh, no, it 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 uh, it was it was an extraordinary experience, a, a wonderful well and 
one of those once in a lifetime type things that you 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 experience and um, so it's it, it was it's been very important in my life but I but again one of the things that I enjoyed uh, very much going in was the was the opportunity to really transform a country and uh, you know Ghana was a blank slate that we had the opportunity to go in and do good things and uh, so I, again the 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 disappointment that we didn't really accomplish writing as well. So so you know it's it it, it was an extraordinary experience and uh, I'm I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to do so. Can I add something? Yeah, of course, please. I think, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't who haven't had real contact with the oil business, one thing they don't often realize is just how hard it is to find oil. I think because we, you know, people in the United States, we've grown up in a country where we have oil. You know, if you live in California, like I, I went to high school in Los Angeles, and I remember Beverly Hills High School had an oil well in the front yard of the high school. Like, you know, we're so used to seeing these oil jack, pump jacks, right? Isn't that what they're called, Jim? These yes. We're so used to seeing them everywhere that we think of it as this resource that's just kind of there waiting to be taken. And I think people don't quite comprehend exactly how impossible it is right. to find fields like Jubilee, how incredibly rare it is, and how difficult it is geologically, you know, technologically. And so, you know, for a guy like Jim, I mean, he's being very modest, but this isn't the first massive field that he's uncovered in his lifetime, and it's, it's, it's kind of an amazing achievement just to be able to say, hey, we found this stuff in the first place. Um, you know, the, the questions that somebody like Ian is really involved with are questions about what happens to the money after. What happens after you've found it? What, how, does that, how does the resource then get harnessed and used to the benefit of all the people that you want to benefit from that resource? Um, and those are questions that can only come up if you actually find the stuff in the first place. Um, Ian, do you have any, uh, anything to add to that? Um, what do you think people are missing out on as far as the issues, issues of transparency and accountability in the oil business go? Well, I think... You know, one of the issues is that you know the film is a is a a slice of time, obviously, and it it ends uh, with a title card that I think Rachel and I went back and forth about a lot uh, in terms of what to say at the end, in terms of how much money uh, Ghana was getting, whether that uh, money was being put to good use, and obviously, at the time the film ended, it was really too early to say. Um, now we've seen over three years of oil revenues come into Ghana. Uh, there's been two billion dollars, in, in, in fact, more than two billion dollars going into the government coffers of Ghana, and so you're able to make some early conclusions about how that money is being spent. On the plus side, there's more transparency in Ghana than any other African country that's producing oil, and we've seen in the past there's stories of massive uh, corruption, looting of revenues, uh, money going into Swiss bank accounts from you know Angola, uh, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea. These stories are far too uh, common. Um, what we see in Ghana is that they took heed of those stories. They put in place a very progressive transparency law. You know down to the barrel how much uh, oil is being produced. You know what the barrel price was when it, the oil was sold. You know how much money down to the dollar Ghana is receiving. So there's a lot of transparency in the system that doesn't exist in other uh, countries around the world dealing with oil booms. So that's that's all incredible. The problem is in terms of accountability and especially accountability in terms of how that money is being spent and how it's being allocated. So in the first three years, more money has gone to the president's office in Ghana and to the state oil company than to basic needs for Ghanaians, whether it's health or education or, or agriculture. Um, so there's a big problem in terms of how the money is actually being spent. Uh, Oxfam supported a campaign last year called Oil for Agriculture. Um, this included peasant farmers, 
um, advocates in the capital, ordinary citizens, and in response to that campaign, the government has allocated more money to support smallholder agriculture in Ghana. And the oil industry, as Jim and Rachel know, it creates very few jobs. It creates a lot of money. Um, and so for this money to be useful, uh, you're going to have to invest it in productive ways. And so there's still a challenge for Ghana to make the most of its revenues and invest it in, in productive activities. So that's something that uh, people still need to work on. Great. Can I ask you a question? I actually, I have a question. Sure. What, what's the, when I was in Ghana with you, they were debating the new petroleum regulations. What's the status of that? Well, so there's a Petroleum Revenue Management Act, which is, which is in place since 2011. The government's trying to revise that. Um, it's sitting in Parliament now. It hasn't uh, gone forward. There's also a Petroleum Exploration and Production Bill that would do a number of good things, for example, requiring open and competitive bidding for new petroleum licenses. And what we've seen in the last few months is that the government has rushed through eight new petroleum licenses. They've all gone to Nigerian companies with very little track record. Um, some of them have been sent through Parliament on a quote-unquote certificate of emergency. And many of those licenses, you can draw connections to to political elites in Ghana or Nigeria. And so there's still a lot of work to be done in fixing the, the legal and regulatory framework. So there's accountability in addition to transparency. Great. Um, Rachel, we're getting, oh, did you have another question? I do. I actually have another question for, for Ian. OK. Uh, sorry. It's about the Dodd-Frank Act. You know, this is something else that you know a lot about that I'm actually very curious to know more about. What's the, first of all, can you explain to me what it is, and then can you tell me a little bit about the status of the U.S. right now? Sure, and that's, I think, something that's very interesting about Ghana is that it discovered oil in 2007 when a lot of people in the international development community, whether it's uh, non-governmental organizations like Oxfam or large institutions like the World Bank are very seized with the challenge of converting oil, gas, and mining revenues into positive development outcomes in poor countries. And so the situation that Ghana found itself in was very different than, say, even 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so what we have in place is uh, the World Bank now requires disclosure of payments and contracts for any project that it finances in the oil, gas, and mining industry. We've got the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed in 2010. It includes a provision that requires any company that's doing business in the oil, gas, and mining sector and is reporting to our U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission to disclose its payments uh, to governments in every country of operation down to the project level. Um, we've been fighting for implementation since that law was passed in 2010. Unfortunately, the uh, oil industry through the American Petroleum Institute sued the SEC got that rule vacated on a technical grounds, and now it's back at the SEC for rewriting. And so we're pushing to have that law fully implemented. The good news is that that law in the US has spurred movements around the world. So the European Union now has a law in place that requires the same thing. So big companies like Shell and BP, but also companies that are doing business in Ghana, like uh, Cosmos's partner, Tullo, on the Jubilee field uh, now have to disclose their payments uh, in every country of operation. So one of the things you see in Rachel's film is a story that's now playing out in other countries. So I was just in Kenya a few weeks ago. There you have Tullo again making a big discovery in a country that's never had oil. Um, but no matter what the Kenyan government does, the Kenyan people will see the payments disclosed as a result of these international obligations. So in terms of the action steps and what viewers to uh, POV can do after seeing this film, um, there's some definite uh, resources for people to look at about the Dodd-Frank Act and other ways that you can get involved around the fight for transparency in the oil industry. Great, and we're uh, trying to post as much of that as possible on the Google Hangout page, but we'll add more after the chat as well so people can Great. learn more about what Ian's talking about. Um, Jim, I'm going to bring it back to you. We're having a few questions on the uh, Hangout page directed at you. Um, uh, well, one question that I have is, um, what's the, what would you say the biggest lesson you learned uh, during your time at Cosmos would be? Um, you said a lot about uh, that, you, that you're proud of the work you did there and that you 
uh, feel like Rachel portrayed everything in a very truthful and uh, very straightforward way. I'm just curious what sorts of what did what do you take away from not just your time there, but also seeing the reflection of it in the film. What's something? Is there anything that you walk, you've walked away from that experience with? Uh, I'm not sure I got the whole quest question, but I'll I'll take a shot at what I think you said. You okay. asked uh, the um, I, I guess the biggest the, the biggest disappointment is, as I said earlier, is that we didn't really get a chance to complete and do the some of the things that we wanted to do there. We had we had great plans with the Kufor. Uh, administration about building uh, uh, electric power plants. We were going to dedicate the the gas that was generated by the fuel to to uh, uh, electric power for the country. And we had we had uh, um, uh, turbines that were on on order that were coming into the country pre the election, and we could have had electricity uh, going to the people. So uh, I think uh, we we talked earlier the problem that we have as an oil in the oil internet people in specialist we're, we're drilling offshore in 5,000 feet of water and so it doesn't really bring a lot of uh, revenue to the local communities and so it's important for us to be able to to, to teach and one of, one of the things that we were hopeful of is that Ghana had the opportunity to build to turn into kind of a hub for the uh, for the uh, service business in that it was it was a, a, a very nice benign country vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Nigeria or, or even Equatorial Guinea other places that we've worked and so we were hopeful that the service companies would all create bases there and uh, and I think some of that's happened but I, it, not nearly as much as as um, as we had hoped for so I guess the 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 whole thing of, of just job creation and what we could have done uh, had we had we had more time and had a had a more receptive government we could have perhaps done more good things to create jobs and, um, and opportunities for the people of Ghana. Okay. Um, Rachel, in the film, did at I, some point you I, discuss. Are you, yeah, you did answer the question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, at some point in the film, you mentioned the uh, what's happened in Nigeria with oil and the um, development of oil in Nigeria. Can you explain a little bit about the background of that and uh, in comparison with uh, what Cosmos was working towards in Ghana? I'm not sure I understand the question. The background of oil in Nigeria, or the background yeah. of the movie, or the background of the militancy, or just the background of the background of uh, how companies. Uh, searching for oil in Nigeria have operated versus how uh, Jim and Cosmos were working to operate in Ghana, whether or not that... Uh, uh, well, Ian's probably better qualified to answer that question than I am. Sure. Uh, he has a lot more expertise in that than I do. I think uh, as uh, oil was discovered in Nigeria right before the end of colonialism, essentially, and um, right before the British left, and it was a very different time. And there were a series of um, dictatorships, basically. And the tone of a dictatorship, uh, it, it, it sets a particular tone for how money is spent, where it's supposed to go. And so Nigeria didn't essentially have the same opportunity at the beginning that Ghana has had. Mm -hmm. Ghana has started in a much better place. They, they had a pretty solid... Um, economy to begin with, comparatively speaking, and they had, a, you know, the beginnings of a pretty solid middle class, or, you know, there was more diversification there economically than there had been in a place like Nigeria that, you know, had been operating under a colonial structure. So it's, the two countries started in very different places, and I think Ghana had a huge, huge, has a huge advantage, certainly, for beginning in a time of a a flourishing democracy where there is debate, where there is a free press, um, where people can exchange ideas and question the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and I think I think um, you know one of the major differences between Ghana and Nigeria is obviously that in Nigeria a lot of the 
the oil production is happening onshore or very close to shore. In Ghana, the, the Jubilee find is, uh, Jim will correct me, I think 60 kilometers offshore. And um, so they're very different community relations issues as well. Um, in Nigeria, you've got, you know, over 60 years of neglect of the communities in the Niger Delta who, who live with these installations, who live with flaring, who live with contamination of their, their rivers and creeks. And at some point in the last few years, uh, Shell, uh, one of the big producers in Nigeria, was spending over $60 million in Nigeria just on community development projects. And that was basically because of failure of the state. The government was not present. They weren't using money to do anything useful uh, in the delta. And the problem with um, the oil industry in the Niger Delta is, is these legacy issues, both of neglect by the companies, but also, uh, more importantly, neglect by the, the government. So if you were a new company, coming into Nigeria right now, and there are few of them that are actually doing that, you'd find it a very difficult operating environment. I think one of the things that's very interesting about the film that Jim experiences is that in Ghana, there are changes in government. There are peaceful changes in government. Elections happen, and, and then they have consequences for the people, but also for, for companies that are, that are doing business in Ghana. And so I think that's part of the, part of the interesting aspect of the film is that this this boom is taking place in a it's it's a democracy it has its problems but I think they're figuring out how to sort themselves out the real challenges now are what happens with the growing cynicism in Ghana um, about ballot box democracy so if people vote every four years and whether it's the NPP party or the NDC party they see uh, corruption and mismanagement growing how do you get ordinary citizens to engage beyond uh, voting every four years to play those watchdog roles so for example in the western region we're supporting a group called friends of the nation and when uh, the movie was playing in Washington DC we had a representative of friends of the nation with Rachel in the Q&A and they've been doing some uh, excellent work working with uh, fishing communities and others um, getting them engaged in how their local governments are spending money that they receive and so making sure that those kinds of um, concerns around corruption don't trickle down to the to the grassroots level and then create mistrust between the government and communities, but also between communities and companies. And I think part of what Jim was saying is that if they had more opportunity to contribute to that and solving that puzzle at the local level, that's something that he would have been interested in. Sure. Actually, that leads into a, a user question that was posted actually before the chat uh, began. Um, and Ian, this might be for you, but Jim, Rachel, if you have any thoughts, please chime in. Uh, based on your experience, what is the single most impactful and realistic change which would allow underprivileged, the underprivileged to take a bigger share of the natural resource pie in developing nations? Is there any, uh, I, I guess, the single most impactful might be a very large uh, question, but do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think based on our work, it all starts with, with transparency. And if citizens don't have access to basic information about these deals that are worth billions of dollars. It's incredibly difficult to know the right questions to ask. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to be able to hold their own governments accountable and that's why we've focused so much over the last uh, 10 years in our campaign at Oxfam which is called Right to Know and Right to Decide and so putting into the public domain um, the petroleum agreements. Um, another interesting thing about Ghana is that all the major petroleum agreements are in the public domain. Um, you can go download um, the Cosmos agreement, you can download the Tullo agreements, find out exactly what kind of deal the government has got, um, what their rights are in terms of being able to audit oil companies for example. Um, and so getting basic information about the deals, um, the payments that are being made, social and environmental impact information, 
well, we believe that communities should have a say in how these projects are designed and developed, and they need that kind of information to, to be able to make informed decisions. So if I was to choose one thing, it would definitely be starting with uh, transparency. And you know, it shouldn't be as difficult as it is, uh, as Rachel was describing, getting information about the oil industry, um, considering that these are public resources in most countries of the world. Um, they're managed uh, on behalf of the citizens by the, the government or the state. Um, there should be much more transparency as a matter of course. Yeah, let me, let me chime, in on, <laughs> chime in on that a little bit. Uh, the uh, uh, Transparency is a huge issue in my mind and, it, and it's constructive for everybody. It's really constructive for us, uh, the, the oil industry, because many times uh, we get the bad rap of we're, you know, we're pillaging country, not really being fair, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so much of that is uh, in places like Nigeria, nothing really trickles down to the people and it's, and it's sad and it's not a good thing at all. If, if in fact there is transparency and the people of a given country can understand uh, number one, as Rachel said, how hard, how hard and difficult and what the terms of, of our deal was with the government going in. And then and then if, you'll, if you go through all of the agreement we had with the governor of Ghana, it's a very fair deal. And, but it, but it, you know, after the fact, when there's all this money bouncing around, people start uh, being concerned that, in fact, uh, it, it, was it fair and was, was it given away? Was there bad thing? Were there bad things done in order to get contracts and all of that stuff? And and there just there just wasn't. And and again, the more transparency for us, the better things are. And then once you get into a, a revenue generating uh, sense, and you know, just the the, the sadness of and the. Because their their government helping them, it's just it's it's a sad thing, and but so I, we're we're all for transparency and, and would love and 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 we we really um, uh, bargained hard with the government of Ghana in order to have transparency where everybody was it, it was well known what our deal was, what the revenue stream is, uh, what where, where that money is going, and it's it's unfortunate that the law is still kind of tied up in in uh, their uh, in their Congress, because it it would it it would be very helpful to everybody if, in fact, it is the transparency laws get put into place everywhere. Yeah, I I, I think that's I think that's right, and the um, the fact that a lot of the debates um, that were happening in Ghana and that are portrayed in Rachel's film were happening on the basis of a lack of information and so a lot of what you see in Rachel's film is people throwing accusations back and forth and they haven't actually seen the contract and the contract didn't come out for the the Cosmos deal a until uh, things were settled and then Cosmos um, had to go to the stock market to raise capital because they knew they were going to have to stay on in Ghana and so because it was a material disclosure, Cosmos disclosed uh, the petroleum agreement. That's how the first petroleum agreement uh, was made public in Ghana. It was through a U.S. website, through the Securities and Exchange Commission website. So it's rather ironic that this whole debate about who gets what, uh, what the deal was, whether it was a good deal, um, the first concrete um, piece of information to be put in the public domain, the Cosmos Agreement, came out through uh, a U.S. government website and not as a result of the Ghanaians requiring it. Right. And I would actually, I'll, I'll, I'll add something to that. As a filmmaker, when I was doing research and making the film, I ultimately had a copy of the contract, um, but I got it from an inside source um, because I went, it was supposedly a, a public contract, but when I went to members of parliament trying to get a copy, nobody could find it, nobody knew where it was, nobody had any, like it was impossible. I went literally to hundreds of different places trying to get a copy of the contract through public means in Ghana prior to what Ian is talking about, prior to that SEC um, declaration, and it was just impossible. Mm -hmm. And the only way I ultimately got a copy was because I, you know, I knew the people involved. Really. But most people, you know, that's 
I, I really think what Jim's talking about is absolutely right on, which is that in the long run, in a sense, transparency can be a very uncomfortable process to enter into for everybody. But in the long run, it, I think it really does serve everybody's interests. Because without it, what you get is you get a lot of suspicion, you get a lot of, you know, people surmising. And in a case like this, where, you know, Cosmos can hold up the truth and say, hey, look at the truth, guys. I think it I think it serves everybody's interests to really be open. That actually leads me to a question, Rachel, for you, um, more about the filmmaking element of things. And I know you get this question a lot, but can you talk a little bit about how you got access and how you ended up knowing people who would get you a document that was so hard to get your hands on? Oh, that sort of thing comes way later. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's, that's way down the line. Um, how'd I get access? Jim, how'd I get access? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, um, I, this didn't start as a film about Cosmos. That wasn't the original idea. My original idea was I was going to make a film in Nigeria. And when I was first interested in Cosmos, I was principally interested in them because they were looking at drilling in Nigeria. And they were talking to a company called Pioneer. And I knew the guys at Pioneer because I spent about a year and a half traveling back and forth to Nigeria from New York, where I live, um, meeting people. This... I, I have, I have to say, this film was extraordinarily difficult to make, and I don't imagine ever making a film quite this difficult ever again. <laughs> it, it was just, it was a very, very difficult thing to. When I, I say this all the time, but it, it somehow I feel like it doesn't have the impact that I wish it did. When I started the film, I knew no one in the oil business, and I knew no one in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And I started by buying a plane ticket to Lagos, Nigeria. That was my beginning. And I, I literally got off the plane, and I knew nobody. And I bought a cell phone, and that's how I started. So describing my process, I mean, it took a really long time, lots of unanswered emails, lots of beers with oil workers and weird, sketchy militant types. Lots and lots of sitting in African waiting rooms, you know, chasing people from Abuja to Lagos to Abuja to Lagos. Lots of money spent on plane tickets that was just a total waste. Um, you know, a crazy amount of energy and time and just not, not giving up. Wow, yeah. I mean, it, it obviously paid off, I, I, but yeah. <laughs> um, we're also, uh, one question that we've gotten a few times is about the risks that you took, and um, not only the risks as a filmmaker and as someone who's yeah, a journalist in a lot of ways, but also, you know, there's, the, there's always the issue of uh, being a woman and a filmmaker uh, going into situations that some might, <laughs> oh, that. Uh, I, 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 I find that kind of insulting, because I, I, you know, I was raised by a single mom, um, I'm an only child, I... I just don't think of being a woman as an issue. I am a woman. I am happy to be a woman. I am. I am woman. Hear me roar. But like, I don't. It's. It's. It's like saying, you know, being being white has as much of an influence on my filmmaking process here as being a woman does. Um, being American has as much of an influence on my filmmaking process. I would say, frankly that, you know, oil men are probably a heck of a lot happier to have me put a radio microphone on them than they are to have some, like, stinky pot belly guy, right? So certainly being a, a woman can help, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't open doors for you. And it, in this particular context, it doesn't necessarily close doors. Mm -hmm. um, with, with people like the militants, for example, uh, they do not allow women in their camps just for religious purposes. Women are not allowed. So getting permission to not just go to a camp, but to sleep there and spend time there and film there in sort of an anthropological way, that was very difficult and took a lot of time, um, especially because I was a woman. In general, the rule of thumb with anything in life is if the person at the top says yes to you, you can get it to work. So this is true, I think, for everything. So the goal is always to get to the person at the top and get their permission and, and proceed from there. Yeah. One, I mean, one question that people ask, not... Actually, this question is more because of the events of what happened with James Foley recently and just the issues of uh, 
yeah, censorship. Are there any risks that, looking back now, you're like, oh, I put myself in danger. I wouldn't have done that again. No, I was extraordinarily careful. I mean, I was. I we were the only film crew that I know. There were many documentary film crews in Nigeria at the time. I know of three others that were arrested and deported. No, I'm sorry, four. I know of four other film crews that were arrested and deported. And I know of another film crew where someone got shot accidentally and they just didn't come back. Um, it's, you know, so part of the reason why we were okay in Nigeria had to do with the fact that I spent a year and a half getting the permissions that I needed in order to guarantee our security. Now, guarantee is a big word, but I certainly did everything I, I could possibly do to make sure that I was okay and that my cameraman was okay. I had a, a letter of permission from the special advisor to the president of Nigeria on petroleum matters, who was a guy that I had made friends with before he got his position. And he had agreed to help me before he got his position. And then when he got his position, he wrote me this letter of invitation to the country on presidential letterhead, like not a forgery, like real presidential letterhead. And I had this letter, and I had it laminated, and I kept it in my backpack. And I literally pulled it out of my backpack, I think, like 10 times a day to show the thugs on the street, to show the police. And I truly believe it was that letter that kept us safe as much as anything. Um, but that letter was extremely hard to get, you know, and it's because of him, because of that man that we had the safety that we needed. He basically guaranteed our safety in the country. Um, what are you working on next? <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Um, well, you know, I, I've been saying I'm going to make a film about my husband, who's a fiction filmmaker. Um, and I very much want to make a film about him making his film. Um, it's a bit up in the air about whether or not that film is going to happen. If it doesn't happen as soon as we would all like it to happen, I actually think I might go to Louisiana and make a film there about um, this, the town, the current state of affairs in the town where 12 Years a Slave happened. Oh, wow. What town is that? Called, well, one of the towns is called Bunky, Louisiana. Okay. Um, Ian, do you want to tell us any more about some of the, um, the initiatives that, uh, that you've mentioned during the chat? Um, well, I think the most important one is the one I mentioned in terms of the one that, uh, you know, Americans should be caring about is um, the implementation of our law, the, the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and I, I think your discussion guide and, and your resources will lead people to find out more about that. Great. All right. Um, is there any, anything else that anyone would like to, to add that we feel like we haven't covered? I want to say thank you to you guys for being here. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Thanks for well, making a great film. Yeah, thank yeah, thanks for making the film, Rachel. And uh, thank y'all for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for sticking with us as well. Um, and the conversation can continue uh, on online at um, ha use hashtag Big Men or hashtag DocChat. And again, the film will be streaming on POV through September twenty fourth, two thousand fourteen, for free. You can visit. Uh, pbs.org slash POV slash big men and you will also find all of the uh, materials that we've created, um, discussion guides, lesson plans, and interviews and all sorts of stuff like that. So thanks again so much to everybody and um, this chat will be, uh, you'll be able to view this chat on YouTube so if you tuned in late you can c go back and catch up with the beginning. So thanks again everyone. Alright, thanks Emma. Thank you. Bye.